Hi everyone, my name is Shanice and welcome back to my channel. The angle is different, the setting is a little bit different, the camera quality is a bit different. I'm actually filming on my laptop because the camera that I regularly use didn't get fully charged and essentially I really want to film this video right now. Planning for a video like this is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I basically make challenges for myself every single year for the big chunky books that I read, the short story collections that I read, and the Latin American books that I read. And it's on the one hand to get through my physical TBR, which is behind me, as you can see, and also to discover new books and get to books that I've just always wanted to read. And it gives me the incentive to finally pick something up that I've just had on my shelves or have put on, if not a physical TBR, then, you know, a Goodreads TBR. It makes me a little bit more disciplined and keeps me accountable in some ways. And it's also exciting just to know that by the end of the year, I will have read these books. Um, and so this video is where I discuss the 12 books that I have chosen to read in 2023, with the exception of, I think, three books. I own all of them, and those three books that I don't have, I will be borrowing from the library and only buying them if I thoroughly enjoy them. Looking at all of them next to me, I am just so excited to finally get to a lot of them. I mean, all of them, obviously. Some I'm a little terrified about because they have quite a reputation for being dense and very challenging, but you know, what is the point of a challenge if it's not gonna challenge you? So let's just dive right in. Uh, it is January, of course, almost the end of January. And so the January pick, I'm basically almost finished with it, about this much through. And finally, I have gotten to Roots by Alex Haley. I've mentioned this book several times on my channel. One, because it's supposed to be one of the inspirations for my writing project. Um, I'm a creative writer and I'm working on a novel. Um, and so it's going to explore a lot of the themes that are explored in this book. This is a whopping 888 page book um, published in 1978 and pretty revolutionary for what it did for the Black American community, for people wanting to learn more about their own histories. This definitely encouraged a lot of people to stay connected to their roots. And of course, there was a lot of controversy with this book because Alex Haley presented it as pretty autobiographical, semi-autobiographical, um, because Kunta Kinte, this man, well, this is the actor who plays him in the History Channel adaptation, which I have not seen, um, but that character actually existed and is in Alex Haley's ancestry, so he is related to this character. This story follows Kunta Kinte from his village in the Gambia and follows him as he is forced to slavery and brought to what is now the United States. Um, and so we follow his family line until we get to Alex Haley. So right now I am on page 612 and you're just going to have to wait to see what my thoughts are on this book at the end of January for my wrap up. And then for the month of February, I'd like to switch things up in terms of genre, um, going from roots, which is very heavy and dramatic and dense. Um, I wanted to go to something a little bit more fun, more fantasy oriented, and I am choosing to finally continue A Game of Thrones. Um, I read the first book more than 10 years ago, and I watched the first season of the TV show, um, and I liked it. And then I started book two, A Clash of Kings, and just never finished it, basically. And so never finished or continued the TV show adaptation either um, until now. What I'm going to do instead of rereading book one is just going to the TV show, watching season one, reading, you know, summaries online, maybe watching some in-depth reviews on YouTube of the book, uh, just to remember all the details because it's a huge book too, before diving into this one. And hopefully that's 
enough help to not be as confused when I pick this up again. This edition is 969 pages and just a fun fact, George R. R. Martin was actually from my hometown and we went to the same high school. And I do plan on using the audiobook to help me get through this a little bit faster. And then for March, I mean I had to do this, right? This is a book that I've owned another one for over 10 years. Um, I bought this in a sale, like a, a Christmas sale at Barnes & Noble, and it's the pages are already yellowing. That's how old it is. Um, for March, I'm choosing Middle March, of course, by George Eliot. My edition has 794 pages. I will also be listening to the audiobook. And as for what it's about, I don't really know too much about it um, other than it's a classic and that it follows the residents of this fictional town called Middlemarch, um, which is supposed to be in the Midlands in England. So other than that, I have no idea. It obviously is about the countryside and about the role of women, of marriage, of education, of class. So I'm you know, fairly certain that there's just going to be a lot of really juicy topics and concepts to analyze and hopefully discuss when I review this. And then for the month of April, I'm moving from the 1800s to the 21st century um, with a contemporary novel called Betty by Tiffany McDaniel. I first heard of this while watching uh, Shailen Wright's YouTube channel. I really love them. Um, and this just sounds right up my alley. It's a coming of age story and the first line, the opening line is a girl comes of age against the knife. Fantastic first line. Um, and it's semi-autobiographical, another thing that I love, uh, about Tiffany's mother whose name is Betty. Um, and so basically Betty is the sixth of eight siblings. Uh, she's born to a white mother and a Cherokee father and lives in poverty and violence in Ohio. So basically it just it's gonna follow the complicated inner workings of this one family centered on this Betty character. And again I love when I'm choosing or like curating this reading list for myself. I really like going from one month to the other switching genres, switching styles. Um, this is gonna hopefully be a little bit faster paced than Middlemarch. Um, I mean, I'm assuming I don't like just putting heavy works back to back to back because I know that's going to drain me and not keep me motivated. So yeah, I'm excited for this one. I think it's going to be a nice respite from the bigger books that come before and definitely after this one. And then for the month of June, I am finally doing it. Uh, I am reading, and this really scares me, um, Ulysses. By James Joyce. Um, I have, I'm gonna read this edition, although I do also own this Penguin Modern uh, Classics version of it, which I bought when I was in Paris. Um, but I did some research and apparently this one is one of the best ones to read. Um, this is the corrected text from 1974. Uh, during which an international team of scholars headed by Professor Hans Walter Gabler began to study manuscript evidence, typescripts, and proofs in an attempt to produce as accurate a new edition as possible. And so this edition, I guess, was published in 1984, although the you know original Ulysses was published in 1922 in Paris, which was not why I bought this in Paris at all, but that's a, actually a nice connection. I didn't know that the novel actually had a connection to France. What can I say? This is one of the most challenging works of all time. Um, references galore, every other word. I don't know how I'm going to survive, but wish me luck and I'm gonna be really proud of myself when I finish this daunting, daunting book. Oh my god. To again switch it up from Ulysses to something, I mean, still dramatic and heavy, but definitely not in the same way. Um, for July, I am going to pick the love songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, and that's by Honoré Fanon Jeffers, published in 2021. Um, I believe it's a little bit over 800 pages. 
obviously I don't own it. Um, that's going to be one of the ones I borrow from the library. Similar to Roots, it does follow a character tracing her heritage, but instead of Roots, you know, moving forward from the first person to the last, uh, in this novel we actually follow the modern day character doing the tracing from, you know, contemporary times. Um, and so she traces her history um, and finds the complete mixture of who she is um, and she learns to understand herself better and it also works into the fictional plot of course works by W.E.B. Du Bois especially his theory on double consciousness um, which I read when I was in undergrad and I mean it's one of the works that has stayed with me my whole life so I'm hoping that this novel is going to have an impact on me and it just it seems like it's going to check all of the boxes that I, you know, usually anticipate in in books. And then for the month of July, I'm going to read Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Idiot. I've always wanted to read this, especially after reading The Idiot by Elif Bottomen um, and reading a lot of her work. She just, she loves Dostoevsky. Um, and this edition is translated by Richard Pevier and Larissa Volkonsky. Um, I, all the Dostoevsky works and most of the Russian works that I own are translated by this duo. Um, I took a war and peace class again when I was an undergrad and I just trusted the professor. He said that this duo is, th those are the ones to go to when you want to read Russian literature. So he was a scholar on Russian literature um, and spoke fluent Russian as well. Uh, so I trust his opinion. Um, he knows way more about it than I do. And let me just read the back because I actually don't know what this is about. Um, it says, the 26-year-old Prince Mishkin, following a stay of several years in the Swiss sanatorium, returns to Russia to collect an inheritance and be among people. Even before he reaches home, he meets the dark Rogozin, a rich merchant's son whose obsession with the beautiful Natasha Filipovna eventually draws all three of them into a tragic denouement. In Petersburg, the prince finds himself a stranger in a society obsessed with money, power, and manipulation. Scandal escalates to murder, of course, as Dostoevsky traces the surprising effect of this positively beautiful man on the people around him, leading to a final scene that is one of the most powerful in all of world literature. Okay, well, <laughs> that sounds very Dostoevsky. I mean, sounds kind of bleak murder, uh, an outcast trying to fit in in a world that doesn't feel like he belongs in. Yeah, sounds like I am going to really love this. For the month of August, I'm finally going to read a Haruki Murakami book. Um, I don't own it yet, but I do foresee that I'm going to like it. And in that case, I will eventually own it because I'll buy it. Um, but it is 1Q84. And it's huge, obviously that's why it's on this list, but I think it's supposed to be split into three volumes um, and it follows the main female character who lives in the year 1984, but in the book this year is happening alongside like another real year 1984. Um, and so in this fake alternate reality, which is where the main character is, she's trying to kind of piece together what is actually fiction, what is reality. She's trying to make sense of who she is and where she is. Um, and she gets involved in like a religious cult or something. Um, now I've never read Murakami, like I said, but everybody loves him so much. And at this point, I feel like I already know what his writing is going to be like. Kind of wacky, very idiosyncratic, um, lots of influences from Ma uh, magical realism, or in this case, I guess, fabulism. Um, I just feel like it's going to be fun and kind of wacky. I don't know. I, I just, I kind of want that for the month of August. Again, after reading Dostoevsky, you just need a little bit of a break. Um, and so I'm hoping this is another one of these nice, thrilling, yet maybe relaxing, enjoyable kind of reading breaks. Um, We'll see, but I am so excited to finally pick up a Murakami because so many people love him. And then for the month of September, I have chosen The Savage Detectives by Bolaño. And let's just read this. It says, in this dazzling novel, 
the book that established his international reputation, Bolaño tells the story of two modern-day Quixotes, the last survivors of an underground literary movement, perhaps of literature itself, on a tragic comic quest through a darkening and tropic universe, our own. The Savage Detectives is an exuberant, raunchy, wildly inventive, and ambitious novel from one of the greatest Latin American authors of our age. So I read 2666 years ago, and it's one of my favorite novels ever. Um, and so I got this for like a dollar um, off of someone on Marketplace um, also years ago. Uh, and it's time for me to just pick this up and read it. And this one is translated by Natasha Wimmer, um, who I believe also did 2666, or the version that I read at least. And I'm expecting poetry, I'm expecting chaos, catastrophe, but with a really astute vision, you know? I'm just excited about this. And then for October, The Iliad by Homer, obviously. Uh, this one is translated by Robert Fagels, and what, I mean, what am I supposed to say about the Iliad? Um, it's huge, for starters. It's, of course, the famous epic poem, um, of the Trojan War. I did read, you know, like, an abridged younger kid's version when I was in high school, and I remember liking it, but never had to read the Iliad since then, only the Odyssey several times in school, which I love. Um, but I feel like the Iliad is one of those pieces of literature that's just retold time and time again, especially as of late. There are a lot of modern day literature adaptations of it. Um, so I think it's just time that I read it in full um, with a trusted translation. Um, I think it's time. I think I need to. Uh, I think it's been too influential for me not to at this point. So for October, wish me luck, I'll be reading this. And then in the month of November, I am going to read Almanac of the Dead, the last one that I do not actually own that I will be borrowing from the library first and maybe buying if I really love it. Um, so this one, again, I don't know too much about it, but it is one of those great big works of literature that people talk about that you must read before you die. It's on the list of some of the best books of all time. Um, and what I know is that it explores native indigenous traditions across the Americas, um, follows a mother looking for her child um, and taking like an adventure across the Americas um, through time, whether or not physically, but you know, mentally, in terms of shared memory and history. Um, it just sounds great. Again, I feel like I've chosen a few books like that uh, this year. Um, and it makes sense because that's something that I'm trying to explore in my writing. Um, but I'm really excited for this. I shamefully do not read that many, you know, indigenous works of literature, which is something that, you know, needs to change. Um, but yeah, this is I mean, it's definitely going to make up for a lot that I haven't read because it's a huge book. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. Uh, so for November, it's going to be Almanac of the Dead. And then at last, for the month of December, I feel like Charles Dickens just works in the holiday season, right? Um, and so this is another one of the books that I bought when I was in Paris. I bought it at Shakespeare and Company. And you can see my little stamp right there. Um, it was the first Penguin uh, English Library edition that I got ever. Um, and it has the waxy front, which they don't make anymore. Um, but anyway, this is Dombey and Son. And I recently saw that Emma and Carolyn read this for their Dickens versus Tolstoy, and they liked it. Um, I don't hear too much spoken about this one. And let me just read the back again. Um, this is a devastating depiction of a man imprisoned by his own pride. It tells the story of a dysfunctional family. At its head is Paul Dombey, who runs his family life as he runs his firm, coldly, calculatingly, and commercially. The only person he cares for is his little son, while his motherless daughter, Florence, craves affection from her unloving father and his defiant second wife, Edith, rebels against him. Dickens' great vision of London in the grip of avarice 
This is also one of his most heartfelt works, showing how love can survive in the harshest world. I think it's perfect that I don't know too much about this. I just want to dive right in and get into the Dickensian atmosphere, which just feels so right for December, for Christmas, for the holidays, for the winter. Um, so I'm really excited for this one. And that is all. Um, 12 huge books that will definitely keep me busy this year. And, you know, I'm just being hopeful. I'm going to take it day by day, read a little chunk of each every single day, um, and just try to be more disciplined about it, not fall back, not fall behind. But I'm genuinely so excited to get to all of them and to be able to say that I number one finished Ulysses and the Iliad. That would be amazing. Um, but also just it excites me looking at that pile and knowing what a different person I will be by the end of the year. Um, so yeah, let me know down below what which one of these books is the one that you're most looking forward to maybe reading along or that you have read and you've loved. Um, I would love to know. Um, and I will see you all next time in my next video. Um, so have a great rest of the month. Bye.